The following interview was conducted with Shelby Barrett, President of Pan Hellenic Association for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April 28, 2010, in uh, Archives and Special Collections. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome, Shelby. Good afternoon, and thank you very much. Thank Let's you tell for us having a little me. bit about where and when you were born and the early years. I was actually born in Lexington, Kentucky. My family um, grew up in Kentucky our whole lives, and I was born in April of 1989 and grew up there for about seven years. My family is actually the only ones that kind of branched out and moved to Indiana, so we're kind of the black sheep of the family. Um, we moved to Carmel, Indiana when I was seven years old in kindergarten, and my mom was actually a teacher at the school that I was at in Lexington, and then she became the principal of my elementary school, so definitely... Oh. How was that? <laughs> I mean, in elementary school, it's okay for your mom to be the principal. If it was a little bit older in high school, maybe it wouldn't be as cool, but um, <laughs> I definitely so little... made sure to keep in line and act good because I knew mom was always around the corner. So. What, tell, what were, tell us about grade school and then go on into high school. What was grade school all right? Um, grade school, I went to Forest Hill Elementary in Carmel, Indiana, and it was, it was a great experience. It's a, it's a beautiful school, and we actually have about 11 elementary schools um, that filter into the Carmel Clay School Systems. So it's a very large city, but it was a great experience, and I actually had the same teacher for second and third grade, and she's still a close family friend, Paige Rago is, and I actually nanny for her son over the summer a few years ago. And she just she's taught me a lot of the things um, about hard work because she was a little bit hard on us in elementary school, and I guess you don't figure that out until an older age, but it's definitely much appreciated, good intentions always because she knew she knew what we were capable of and the potential that we had so sure, she yeah. never let us settle for anything but our best and go on to high school tell us about high um school. high school carmel high school is one of indiana's biggest high schools it's about four thousand kids and it keeps growing they had to build a new freshman center in my graduating class in 2007 was around 931 people and we actually had to hold it at the verizon music center in noblesville indiana and it was funny because we'd be sitting in the audience and they were calling names and people would walk across stage. And I looked at the person next to me and be like, I've never seen that person before. You, you'd see somebody new at school every day. So it was definitely an, a, a learning experience because a lot of my friends went to small schools such as DePaul University, which has about 2,000 to 3,000 people. And that's less than my high school was. So that's I knew that a bigger university was where I wanted to be. What student activities were you in? And, and what, were you in athletics as well? Yeah, I've actually, I played softball for 10 years from when I was 8 to age 18. And I played for a travel team and for the high school. So um, that took up most of my time. And my dad was actually my coach for our travel team. And over the 10 years, um, our team, we had a, a very good core group of girls my age that we played together. So we were very fortunate. And we actually won, I think the total was four state championships and then a national title when I was 14 years old. So Super. <clears throat> it was a while ago, but that took up most of my time because I really tried to sure. focus Practice on softball year-round. Like there was a few things that I was involved in, such as the Carmel Dance Marathon that just got started up about five years ago. What's, what's that, that? Tell us about that. What does that entail? Um, Carmel Dance the Marathon. Uh, they have it at IU, and IU actually runs Carmel High School's Dance Marathon since we have so many kids and so many donors. But one of the women, Ashley Krause, she was the student body president at Carmel High School, and she went on to Indiana University, and she was killed in a car crash her sophomore year at school. And so it became that's when it became really big at Indiana University, and that's when everybody really got into it because they kind of had a personal connection. Sure. And her younger brother was a senior at Carmel High School at that time. So that's what really got the motivation started at Carmel High School. And actually, it's, fan, it's uh, fascinating, but Carmel High School actually raised more money the past two years than Purdue did. And I don't know how with a high school. Well, how is Purdue tied in with it? Well, they do it at a lot of universities. Oh, I see. And they have it here. Uh, they hold it mm -hmm. here? Okay. All the money goes to Riley Children's Hospital, and that's where it's based out of. It's one of their biggest fundraisers that comes in for their hospital. And they do it. Um, Penn State actually has the largest dance marathon, and they raise about $7 million. And I don't know how they do it, but... What, what exactly <clears throat> entails it? Is that, it goes for a certain period of time? Yeah, it's 18 hours. 
Um, it's called Dance Marathon. You don't necessarily dance for the whole 18 hours, but you do have to stand on your feet for 18 hours straight because you're kind of it kind of represents standing for those who can't. And you actually learn a dance throughout the whole night that you end up doing at the very end. And there's also Riley kids that come in, and if they're too young, their parents will share their stories or they will share their stories, and it's really inspiring. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. How'd you do this year? Good. Um, I think the total, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, right. but maybe around 90,000 or 80,000. Do you get donors that, how, did, how does the funding come in? Uh, with the yeah, as um, dancers, you have a minimum of $75 to raise to be a dancer, but you're supposed to set goals higher than that for yourself so you can find individual sponsors for yourself. But we also um, call many corporations and there are large donors such as the university and um, other corporations around the local area. So mostly it's individually raised. But they do get some outside support. Mm -hmm. That's great. <clears throat> and That's then cool. foods donated for sponsorship Super. and other things like that to keep. Do they move it to different uh, colleges within the state? Is that how they do it? Or is it just between maybe IU and Purdue? Or um, IU, Purdue. I know Penn State has it. Okay. I'm sure there's other universities that do it. Kentucky University might do it. Sure. I'm not sure. But I know it's, it's a pretty well-known organization um, because Riley is the center of it, obviously. Does the Penn State money also come to Riley? Theirs might be another yeah. local oh, hospital. Oh, okay, okay, but primarily it's for hospitals is what the funding is. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what the exact Super. title of the one is, but Super. it's okay. a very large funding. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your major and, and extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. My major right now is public relations and advertising, and I'll be graduating in, in May of 2011. So I still have another year. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the future has in store for me, but I guess my dream job would to be a part of a PR and advertising company for a major sports organization. That's kind of my dream, maybe the Colts or Kentucky or. University. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll see where that takes me. That's I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Uh, now, the, you're the president of uh, Pam Hillig. Tell for the researchers what that association is and then <clears throat> talk about some of the challenges and initiatives and programs and things that you were involved with. Yeah, this year. I was president of the Panhellenic Association from December of 2009 to December of 2000, no, December of 2008 to December of 2009 um, for a year. And that was actually from the last of my sophomore year into the beginning of my junior year. And the Panhellenic Association is kind of the higher organization that oversees all of the sororities on campus. It's affiliated with the National Panhellenic Conference and all of the sororities they have 15 National Panhellenic Conference chapters. Um, they're nationals. That's kind of what falls under their organizations because you have the National Panhellenic Conference at the top, and then you have national organizations, and then you have college Panhellenics, and that's what we have here at Purdue University. So it's kind of the overseeing body of all f of our 15 NPC chapters, and then our five um, non-NPC chapters that are affiliated with our Panhellenic Association. Okay. Okay. Were there any um, initiative <clears throat> programs and things that you started, that, some new, new things that you did this year? Yeah, well, some new things that we did. Um, we actually revised and adopted a joint social and risk management policy between the Interfraternity Council and the Panhellenic Association. And the, the Interfraternity Council, it's a mirror image of the Panhellenic, but it's for the men's. So it's the overseeing body of all the fraternities on campus. And we work very closely with each other. And we've, um, we haven't had kind of a universal policy that included both men and the women in risk management terms. The women had been written in previously um, for other purposes, and then it got dropped, so we really felt like we needed a universal risk management social policy that included everybody, right? Because we didn't think it was fair for you know the men to have a certain set of rules and for the women to have a different set of rules as well. And then within that risk management policy, um, a new organization was created called Caliber, and it's an independent organization of the fraternity and the sorority community, but they kind of serve our community through education and observation. And Corey Baltima is the current president of Caliber, and what their main goal through education is um, they go to each individual chapter houses for fraternities and sororities, and they can give presentations such about things as you know eating disorders or binge drinking, and he has actual chairs, that that's their main responsibility. And my um, individual sorority actually had them come, I believe it was, last Monday. 
right. to give a binge drinking presentation. So really their main goal is just to educate everybody on the risks of alcohol and all the other risks that um, we, we as college people face. Right, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's very good. <clears throat> yeah. One thing I was going to ask, didn't Van Hellenic used to do your plant sale? Yes, they did right. used to do the plant sale. Um, we, we had a switch in advisors. Um, Kyle Pendleton is the director of Returning and Sorority Life, and Diane Blackwater used to be a director of Returning and Sorority Life. And when um, it was kind of her thing, she loved it a lot. And but there it wasn't been going for some time. Yeah, it, right. it had been going. So I used to buy, buy plants. For yeah, them. and there wasn't a lot of funding going on. Um, sometimes you know the gross wouldn't be a positive. So we um, kind of handed it off and asked if anybody else wanted to take control of that. And I'm pretty sure the whole horticulture club is gearing that up now, so. That would be good. It's mm-hmm. nice because I think that particularly when you're new on campus and you've got, you're setting up your apartment mm-hmm. or your room or anything like that, and the prices were so, and they, the other nice thing about it was they had somebody from Venice that was here and right. you know, circulated around and, and could give you some ideas of whether this would be good for indoors or how much yeah. care you needed to yeah. do. Yeah, and there were that core group of people that loved it so much, but I think after a few years they were the only ones coming back, so a lot of times we ended up with a lot of plants and not enough <laughs> to sell. Big, yeah, you had a big room to It was the whole the union field. ballroom filled with plants. So right. sometimes it was hard to get the message out because it's just through the union. And people don't always necessarily think about I remember one time somebody had bought one of those big plants and had a, <laughs> a hatchback. Yeah. They were having a terrible time. It was just a terrible time getting it. And they finally just said, forget it. You know, and they just couldn't get it in. Yeah. You know, well, time. usually it's kids traveling, students traveling from class to class. And they don't necessarily want to pick up a huge plant and have to take it and then take it back home. Right. So I'm sure the hassle of it might have been a part of it. Oh. Leadership, your thoughts on a leader's role in academia and the professional world? Yeah, um, in the academic world, I kind of see leaders in the position of one that's not necessarily elected, but one that you kind of take upon yourself because um, we as leaders in the academic, obviously that'll take us into the future as leaders in the professional world. We all start in the academic world in some way, shape, or form, and I think that kind of molds us, and that's where we get the core Um, of our techniques that we use as leaders and the knowledge that we'll use. So I think leaders in the academic world are definitely important and essential to organizations because, you know, if we didn't have leaders in the academic world, then who would be our leaders in the professional world? And It it transitions. Yeah, it kind of filters too. And there may be, you know, there's always people that don't necessarily assume leadership in the academic roles and then, you know, step up to it. But there's definitely always room um, for leaders, I don't think you can ever have too many. And people and you that get good experience. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Um, experience is one of the best things you can have because you know when you go into a job interview, and all you have, you know, is academics. The experiences are a huge part of it as well, and your involvement. So sure. Mm-hmm. How did you get? Were you, uh, how did you get elected? Had you had other offices in the association? Um, I. They have a kind of a junior oh. panelinic, what we call the associates board, and it's uh, primarily for freshmen. Um, kind of sophomores to learn the ways of Panhellenic, so kind of almost an internship with the Panhellenic to see how everything's run and to talk to girls and, you know, you help out as well, you, your assistants to some of the directors. And so one of my mentors, actually Lauren Mizowitz, she was one of the vice presidents of Panhellenic when I came into my freshman year, and she really encouraged me to get involved because I knew I wanted to get involved, but I just really wasn't quite sure where my fit was going to be. And when I saw how hard all these um, women were working and the results that they were producing because they really were, you know, producing programs on campus and you could see the effects, I knew that I wanted to get involved in the summer after my freshman year. I was presented with the opportunity to attend a five-day program as a member of Panhellenic, and it's called the Undergraduate Interfraternity Institute. And it's a five-day program, and it's a values-based program. And we, Purdue actually had the first ever campus-based UIFI, is what they call it. And so we were very excited to do it. And we had it at Camp Jameson in Indianapolis. And it was there was 80 fraternity sorority members from all four councils. And kind of the motto of the weekend was live your ritual. Because I know a lot of times, you know, we think about the history of our fraternities and sororities and when they were founded, you know, in the 1800s or the early 1900s. Sure, exactly. and. You think back about, you know, the real reasons why, what they were founded upon and the values. About what brought them in. Right, and a lot of people, you know, we ask ourselves the questions. If our founders came to our chapter today, would they be proud of the legacy that we're living? Because they went through a lot to, you know, get to where um, the chapters are today. And 
we just really try to, they try to instill in us um, the passion to just live your ritual every day if you're making your founders proud because there's a reason why they started there. And why it's lasted so long. Right, and why it's lasted so long. And exactly. spread to other, in, other places. Exactly. You can just see the large impact sure. that it's had. So just really, you know, living your ritual on a day-to-day -day basis. And it just kind of reminds us um, of the our founders and the core reasons. How you got started. Why our, yeah, just kind of like taking us back to our roots. Because right. I think sometimes that helps people kind of remember why they're doing what they're doing. And it puts it in a focus, too. And, <clears throat> and it's good... It's good background information, I think, for right. people. And the, the core of the motivation and the passion that I kind of had for the panel and extend from this UIFI experience, and I knew going into my sophomore year, I wanted to assume a higher position in Panhellenic, but I just really wasn't sure what that was going to be. And I had a lot of people approach me and be like, you know, maybe you should run for president. And I was a sophomore at that time, and the thought of that kind of scared me <laughs> to no end. And, you know, I didn't know if people would think of me you know, because there were, if I got the role of president, there would be people working under me that were two years older than me or a year older than me. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but I didn't want other people to have a problem, a problem with that. So I guess I just, I got the confidence to do it from a lot of my mentors that believed in me. Sure. And I gave my speech and I answered my questions. And before I knew it, I walked back in the door and they were congratulating me. So I, I was very humbled by the thought that people really thought of me in that way and believed in me. It was a nice, a nice thing in your path that they really, mm -hmm. that you really, you merited and you really <clears throat> had shown that you were more than qualified. Right, and it, it was definitely um, a valuable experience despite all the hard work and long hours right. that were put into it, you know, coming home really late at night, waking up really early in the morning and have no free weekends to do anything, but honestly I wouldn't change it for the world because it's made me who I am today, and I know, you know, my experience in the Panhellenic like, Association will probably take me further in my life than almost any class there ever will, go. just just from the experience. So it was, That's right. it was an amazing experience. I had to give you that. In, in the <clears throat> President's Formula, Pete Crockett, I wondered if you had any comment yeah. on those. Yeah. Um, I had, actually had you have you uh, been in anything that he's spoken at? I didn't hear his exact okay. speech, but I've I've heard of the challenge model before. Okay. Or uh, it's, I believe it's called the challenge model right. that he spoke about. Something like that. Right. Yeah, with the five different steps, and I just kind of like had some things in mind that I thought about each one because I know his first step was challenge the process. And I guess my thoughts about challenging a process is doing what's never been done before. That's kind of what I see as challenging the process because I think leaders are somebody who can kind of take us to a new place that maybe we necessarily might not have thought was possible or didn't wasn't imaginable. But we know it's there. But we know it's there, absolutely. Leaders... Um, they like to transform their organization. Sometimes managers, you know, they just like to maintain the status quo and make sure companies are maintaining the best. But I really think leaders like to transform in some way because they have an idea. And then obviously the next um, part that Keith Crock talked about was inspiring a shared vision. Right. And obviously, you know, leaders, as I said before, they can see what others um, can't see. And you have to be able to articulate your vision clearly. And I think I experienced that kind of during my speech when I was running for a Panhellenic president because you know what you want to do and but people may not necessarily get the same message as you're articulating so you have to make sure that everybody is understanding clearly what you're saying so there's not any mixed messages. Right, exactly. Good point. Very mm -hmm. good. Uh, enabling others to act. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously for you to accomplish a goal or to accomplish a vision, you have to have the support of others and you have to be able to encourage others and have trusting relationships with them if you want them to come along with you in any capacity and to go along with what you're saying. And you have to have their support, but you have to also support them as well. And you have to have your goals right. to enable others to act so they see kind of the end goal in mind and see progressively where an organization could be rather than just where it stands. And where you fit in and how you can make it. <clears throat> exactly, everybody's position right. and where they fit in. Good, good point. Uh, encourage the heart. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important things. It always sticks out when I see that, something about encouragement or about, you know, the heart. Because even in, you know, the real world, you can't just tell people what to do. If somebody tells you what to do, you're not really sure why that person told you to do it. And I think the real reason behind visions are why. Why do you want to do this? Why should I do this? Why are you making us do this? Or why are you telling me to act in this way? Or why should I follow you in this direction of your new vision. 
And if you don't give people a reason why, I mean, they have no real reason. And they may not react properly, which they should. Yeah. Because you want, you're looking at it from both standpoints. Exactly. I and I think people in our world like to have a purpose right. and a reason for their actions because, you know, sometimes when you get in your daily routine of work, um, you kind of wonder, you know, why am I here? You know, you kind of forget that sense of why you wanted to do it That's right. in the first place. And so you have to keep that in mind from keep the beginning, middle, right. to end. Keep the focus in perspective. Right, good point. Exactly. And then model the way is the other point that he has. Yeah, he has some others, but these are the key ones. Right, right. and I guess the first thing, yeah. you know, when I think that you have to practice what you preach, is everybody say, because you can't expect others to do what you say if you're not willing to do it yourself. And I know one of my favorite quotes is, a great leader's courage to fulfill his vision comes from passion and not position. Because leaders aren't necessarily always in a position of, you know, power or hierarchy. But if they have that passion, they'll be able to model the way. Because I think a leader is someone who, who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Because you can't just go by yourself. You can't just know what needs to be done. But you have to have others on board right. for Good anything point. to be accomplished. Very nicely said. That's nice. The uh, Mortar Board Leadership, did you, have you attended those? Um, I wasn't able to attend this year. Okay. I really wanted to, but we had conflicts with that weekend. But I actually just got... Um, tapped for Morta Board. Okay. So I will be a part of the Morta Board Leadership Conference process next year. Are you going to be? Will you? Are you going to be the president uh, next year as well? Of, uh, huh? of, of the Pan Hellenic? Or, or no, your, I, your, your, my oh. term was up in December, oh, okay. and it's been passed to Mia McCurdy, the new president. Okay. So she has that until December. Okay. I'll have to try to get her as well. Then yeah. That's good. Um, how about a favorite Purdue tradition? Do you have a tradition of Purdue that? Like? Favorite Purdue tradition. Hmm, that's a tough one. There's so many good ones. Well, pick it doesn't doesn't it can be more than one, you know. Um, I I really enjoy pre and pre a lot, just from its um, from the history of it to how we do it here. Because I know a lot of other schools have traditions that they do every year, and some are centered around homecoming or. You know, Indiana University has their little five, but I really think Grand Prix is a huge tradition here that everybody gets excited about. You can just feel the excitement on campus and the fact that these people, you know, build their own um, cars to race. It's just, it's fascinating to me. And I think it's going to be interesting if they go with the electric. And right, I, I saw that in the paper you, today. Yes. Yeah, it's, it'll be interesting. It's <clears> nice that they had that. Um, and also the other thing, of course, I live near where the old Grand Prix there, mm -hmm. and I sort of, I miss it. Um, Some, because I used to, you know, and <clears throat> they would practicing and things and watching the people go over there, and uh, yeah. I, I really do miss it. That's exactly <laughs> what one of our mortar board advisors said. She said she misses just hearing the cars go round and round as much as she kind of was like, you know, is that noise ever going to stop? She kind of misses it now that it's it gone. It never bothered. It was wonderful. <clears throat> I really, you know, and years ago... They used to have a carnival about that time before they, the stadium and the and people, that. They used to bring uh, their children and things of that sort. And, and it was sort of nice because they had a Ferris wheel and you could see it at, at night, sort of, you know, with the lights and everything, but they haven't had that in a long time. No, that's time. such a coincidence because at the same mortar board meeting, we were talking about our favorite sure. Purdue Somebody, traditions, our favorite things about Grand Prix. And she brought up the carnival and we all kind of looked at each other and we were like, yeah, let's have a carnival. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Awesome it sounds exciting. Oh, um, do you have an outstanding event? <clears throat> is something that comes to mind? An of outstanding event in your life? That I've experienced? Yeah. <clears throat> I would say, I guess one thing that comes to mind, I guess sometimes when people ask me what one of my greatest accomplishments okay. is um, that national championship that we won when, <laughs> even though I was 14 years old, That's just, fine. I know, still thinking you about it. You never lose that. Yeah. You know, and the older you get, the more... <clears throat> It, it means it's meaningful. You know? Yeah, it's wonderful. And I mean, softball was, you know, one of the main reasons that I feel like I'm I'm such a hard worker. And I, when I do something, I don't, you know, just did you, give did it you, half. Uh, best. Uh, try for the team here. You, you know, I, I talked to that coach previously because I wasn't sure whether I was going to go to Kentucky and follow the route of my family and my sister because my sister was at Kentucky. Um, she would have been a senior, and I was a freshman. She swam there for four years, so I didn't know if that was the direction I was going to go. Um, I actually. I, I talked to the coach a little bit here, but they had already filled other spots, and you know she welcomed me to come to the walk-on tryouts, and so I knew that I couldn't do that and be in a sorority at the same time, because um, for Purdue, our recruitment's in the fall, 
it's the first weekend after classes, so it's really soon, and I knew I had to make that decision. Right. But obviously, looking back now, I think I made the right decision. I know I made the right decision because, you know, I learned all that hard work and dedication from those 10 years in softball, and I think it was time for me to move on to something else. And, you know, the Panhellenic Association um, was provided me the opportunity through my sorority. So I think, you know, I, did it. I didn't know what that decision, what was to come of it, but looking back... It's worked out. Yeah. It's, it's definitely it worth it. Right. It's worked okay. out. Uh, so you're going to be in, uh, be here another year. And tell us what you're going to do in the summer, and then I'll leave anything I forgot to ask or that you'd like yeah, to Yeah, this summer I will actually be working um, for the third summer in a row at Camp Tecumseh. It's a YMCA camp. It's about 25 minutes outside of Lafayette in Brooks in Indiana. It's a very well-known camp. It's one of the um, highest-ranked YMCA camps in the nation. And it's, it's just such a wonderful place because – you kind of get away from society for a little bit. It's kind of a nice um, break from the real world because in the village that I'll be living in, you don't get phone service. So it's it's definitely an interesting experience. And there's about 80 of us college students, and it's just it kind of just brings you back to life. And what are the ages? Do they stay there for the whole? <clears throat> how does the camp run? They it's run a nine-week program, okay. and kids can come for one, two, or three weeks at a time. Most of them only come for a week. And the ages range from 8 to 15, and that's how long they can be a camper for. And Camp Tecumseh actually kind of sets you up to be a counselor because after you're 15 and you turn 16 or finish your junior year of high school, you can be part of the SILTS program, and I'm going to be actually one of the four SILT counselors this summer. And it's a new program, so I'm really excited about that. And it stands for Campers and Leadership Training. So I'm really excited to, you know, inspire younger leaders because – and it's more so focused on um, you know, your leadership, your personal leadership style, and working with others as a group because there's going to be about 40 of them total. So they learn how to work, and especially for 16-year-olds, it's definitely a difficult time in high school. Yeah, okay. So it's good for them. And then if they want to move on to be counselors one day, it kind of sets them up, and they actually get a shadow, some of the counselors. So That's very <clears throat> What sort of activity? Do they have swimming out there too? Yes, we okay. have um, two pools and a lake. And we just got a blob tower this for the summer. I don't know if you know what a blob tower is, but it's a big inflatable kind of tarp, I guess you could say. It looks like just a big pillow, but <laughs> one person sits on the end of it and the other's up in a tower and you jump on it and like the pressure goes down on it so the person at the end of it flies up into the little lake. Oh, and it's, it's very entertaining to watch I can the, well the little kids. You know, there's kayaking and canoeing and a rope swing and water slides at the lake. Super. Yeah, and then we just we do a lot of activities. It's summer camp's definitely one of those experiences that you always remember as a kid. Right. And it's and it's it's nice, you know, and it's really it, it sort of makes the time pass and it's something a little different. Oh yeah, and it's just beautiful because you live in a cabin and some of my friends are like, you know, I don't know how you do that for so long because we don't have AC in the cabins and sometimes you find the occasional bug. But you know, <coughs> it's okay. You, That's, man, you manage. It's part of nature, exactly. Yeah. Do you have any any of your other friends who are going to be out there that have been there before? Um, yeah, I'm, we have a very um, large percentage of return rate for counselors because yeah. a lot of the counselors grew up as campers there and have been there for you know five, ten, fifteen years. So it's kind of become everybody's second home and second family. Mm-hmm. And I my look parents, forward to the summer. Right. Exactly, and my parents are always you know sometimes like. You know, why do you want to go back to camp? You know, don't you need maybe an internship or a job in the real world to put down in your application or your resume and get experience? But it's honestly just one of those experiences that you have. It's kind of difficult to understand unless you've been through yourself, but it's just kind of another world out there. And, you know, and you I get think away. You're, what you're going to do this year working with the, the high school yeah. and the leadership, that's just great. And that's I worked wonderful. for the past two summers, I worked mainly with the 15 year old girls. So a lot of them will be campers that I've had before that I've developed really good relationships because I think I've become not necessarily like a counselor and somebody, you know, as a babysitter to watch you, but as a mentor and somebody that they can always count on, you know, as a big, as a big sister, right. I That's guess. That's a if, good role for you to have. Right. If, you know, I think young girls in our society kind of need somebody to look up to and to go to for advice, you know, if they don't always go to their mom because some right. topics are nice sensitive. Right. have a time when it's sort of nice to have some mentoring and, and, and they – Start that at an early age, and as you go through life, it's nice to have mentors, and it means a lot. Oh, it means it means a great deal because I know how much I respect and appreciate, 
you know, the people that I looked up to at that age, because it is a difficult age. I mean, it is. we all experienced, and, you so know. So it's nice to be able to, to be helping out. Every exactly, because, you know, you've been there before. And That's right. It's funny, because, like, I feel so much older, but if I think about it, I mean, I'm 21, and these girls are 15, 16 years old, so I'm hoping, you know, that by inspiring them and helping them that when they grow up, they'll do the same. They'll be at their age, they'll feel the same way that mm -hmm. you do. Kind of a pass it on. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you I very much. I appreciate that. Appreciate Thank you so much.